and uh, frank capra he said that he, he didn't understand what drama was he always thought that drama was when the actors cried but that was not drama drama was when the audience cried welcome to the top hat club so i'm telling you kid where you been should be a little bit over your eyes to look mysterious oh like that there you go Should except you off? no and why we are wearing these hats is because uh i they make told... us look hot <laughs> well uh, well you look good i think i look like a joker but anyway i'm still going to keep wearing it so <laughs> but uh, but you know i enjoyed that film so much and uh, i thought that uh, there, there was something that i wanted to do about this and i thought that why not wear a hat and i'm just hoping that people don't catch on to how inappropriate this hat with this t-shirt is but i don't really care so i wanted to wear this hat and i am wearing this hat so uh, all right everyone so uh, we are here again and we have tim with us today and today we are going to discuss this film called it happened one night and uh, uh tim is still to uh, reveal how he liked it but i absolutely loved the film uh, but before before we start discussing the film i'm going to go uh, talk about something absolutely irrelevant uh to this whole video uh, so tim you remember that uh, that song by madonna uh, papa don't preach yeah so papa what is yes yeah, so, so so what is she actually trying to say that uh, so one interpretation is that she is pregnant and she wants to keep the baby or mm-hmm. another uh, interpretation is that uh, she is just in love with the guy and she is calling the guy baby and she is saying that i won't let him go so, so so what is it actually no idea i always thought it was the uh, pregnancy thing is it really i have no idea and it's been almost 20 years i haven't heard the song and you know as a kid i always used to think if she is saying papa don't preach i need tumbleweed and i thought that is what the song was <laughs> hey we all need a little tumbleweed right <laughs> actually that makes sense i need freedom tumbleweed yeah so i don't know but uh, but but i don't i don't really get that song because what she's saying is that uh, she knows that he's been right she knows that he was the guy that she shouldn't have been with and she's saying don't preach me i'll i'll i'm just so arrogant that i'm not going to listen to you and i'm going to do what i want to do and uh, even if you think it's ruined my life and even if i think i've ruined my life i'm still going to be happy with the uh, i don't know i I can't comment except that I don't have the from the little bit I remember um maybe not such a dark meaning preach papa don't preach meaning now is not the time to criticize me now I need your your compassion and tumbleweed and your sympathy yeah and your forgiveness so don't preach okay so well, so, so don't go I told you so kind of yeah 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 Yeah, now is not the time. I need your sympathy, daddy. Mhm. Okay. All right. So moving on to the film. How did you like it? Oh, I absolutely loved it. Like I I I think I told you earlier I saw this film when I was in college. It was part of a film appreciation class and fell in love with it back then. And since then I've used it in my own classes. I've I've shown it at a movie club I used to have and I was amazed that the students of course i'm going back 15 years but even 15 years ago it was amazing that the students would love it so much and um i haven't seen it in such a long time it was a joy to watch it again thank you now you recommended it so thank you <laughs> and uh, also hey, don't I- preach <laughs> i thought that the film was uh, released in 39 but i checked and it was 34 and not 39 and yeah. uh, also the film is based on a, on um, i i try to trace that piece of literature but the film is based on a story called uh, night bus and i tried oh. to, i tried to get it from uh, but i couldn't get it from anywhere so uh, so if you happen to you know just hey we've got maya with us yeah this is my cat she refuses to be let down Hello. she says papa don't preach oh is she pregnant so night bus no oh no. okay Okay. She's just in my way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But okay. okay, so the story is called Night Bus. 
Yeah, and I tried to get hold of it, but I couldn't get it. Okay, I'll do a library search. Yeah, so if if you get it from anywhere and if it's possible to share, please do that. Sure, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Always happy to share. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, you, uh, okay, okay, you go. So, what, what do you like about the film? I. Th- what do I like about it? I thought it was a very sharp-witted humor. That it's the 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 comedy of opposites. He's the worldly man, which doesn't mean he's rich. He's the guy who's had experience surviving on the streets as a reporter, as a tabloid reporter. You know, he's the guy who's a fast talker, smart. He also knows how to fight. He's tough. And she's the pampered, spoiled daughter of a millionaire who's run away from her father so that she could elope with somebody. And it's just that delightful opposite that's humorous. And also, I, I think I noted that whenever he was in a good mood, she was in a bad mood and vice versa. So the directors always made sure that they kept these two characters at polar ends of each other until eventually opposites attract. And when it looked like it was possible that she could harden and he could soften, then they, they got together. I mean, the film is, is so many years old. It's not a spoiler alert if we say at the end of the film, they get married. No, it's a romantic comedy. So everyone knows they would get married anyway. So it's yeah. not like, it, there's nothing... Uh secret about the plot the minute you say that it's a romantic comedy you know what the story is so yeah. uh, that's there. although it's not often um, identified as a romantic comedy it's classified as a, a slap what is it zany comedy they, they call it a screwball comedy no screwball comedy thank you thank you interesting um, side bit of um, observation in 34, when the film was released, um, Hollywood had just gone into talkies to sound films not too much earlier. And Hollywood cinema, the, especially the talkies, came out of vaudeville. And you notice the homage in the film, the, the um, bus singing s- scene. You know, oh, da, 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 that flying trapeze song. These were probably all vaudeville artists and singers, stage actors. And also the guy who played, um, oh goodness, I've already forgotten his name, Shai, the traveling salesman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, Um, I would name, but I get what the one. Yeah. He looks exactly like a vaudeville comedian, especially that same type of character. No, I'm not saying, mister, but you know, I'm saying it anyway, that, that, stage presence this is vaudeville is where so many of the good acts started i think bob hope um abbott and costello they all started on stage with these acts of zany physical humor mixed with quick one-liners so i like that this film still included that and it fit yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it like it was a pleasure watching this film you know uh, there were there were more than one it's it was so nice, and I think the appropriate way, as we've discussed before, also the uh, the best possible way to describe the film is that it's a very cute film. Yeah, you know, like uh, the characters are. Uh, it's it's so charming this whole film, and and the actress who, who's like playing this female lead, uh, she comes across as so innocent, and yes. and and the way she's acted with her eyes, it, it is it is just um, it, it's just so beautiful. This uh, is a very popular film, I believe, for all film school students. And we have two uh, Hindi remakes of this film. So one was done way back in uh, the 50s, if I'm not mistaken, which was called Chori Chori. So it was a film starring Nargis and uh, Raj Kapoor, who were like the biggest stars back then, which was a big hit 
and and the songs were really nice i still listen to those songs uh, and then we had another remake in the 1990s which was called dil hai ki manta nahi uh, now, now that's a film which i have seen uh, more number of times and uh, i used to have a vhs tape i still have but i don't have a player anymore <laughs> so i can't play it anyway uh, but uh, and I, i i whenever i would you know if i didn't have anything to do or uh, i just wanted to sit and have my lunch and there was no one around and stuff so i would just put this film on and i would watch it and i i kind of like have memorized this film line by line this and uh, be- the beauty and the beast the the old animation so these were the two vhs tapes that i've grown on and <laughs> and you know i was amazed to see that they have picked dialogue by dialogue like they didn't even work on the script so they've just picked up the dialogues and then they've translated them into hindi they have just taken the screenplay and they've just redone it and that's it so there was no surprises in the film for me when i was watching it there was no surprise at all like i knew everything this is going to happen now this is going to happen now this joke is going to come now this joke is going to come and so on and so forth but still i was able to enjoy the film so much and i was amazed at that like you know uh, what a well made film that it works even if you know exactly what's going to happen You know what's interesting about this is uh, and this is why I haven't seen the um the remake that you're talking about with oh my goodness help me the actor's name Amir Khan and uh, Pooja Bhatt Amir Khan yeah yeah I haven't seen it yet I've just uh, flipped through it when you gave me the link on YouTube but um this Hollywood film was everybody emphasizes that it was pre-code pre-code there was a period I don't know when I think in the late 40s when the US uh, government uh, the Senate threatened to censor Hollywood films because until that time Hollywood films of the period were very risque very very bawdy and they showed strong powerful women and they were not uh, shy about um, sexual themes So this film was actually pre-code era. What happened in Hollywood was the the big studios at the time, I think there were four major studios. Um they got together and they created a set of rules, you know, no nudity, no uh showing someone getting shot directly, things like that. They made these rules which they then showed to the US Congress and the US Congress did not pass any laws censoring films but the industry censored itself i could be wrong i think i might be confusing this with the comic book code that happened you know that's why we have superhero comics because comic books were under threat of being very very heavily censored by the government so the comic book industry itself censored itself so i could be talking out of my hat apologies but it's funny because if this film belonged to that period we should have expected to see a much sexier um in your face female character and maybe a much more um abusive man i don't know but it didn't do that it stuck with light comedy excepting for the spanking in the river <laughs> uh the spank in the river will touch uh in a while but i think them uh, this film was in fact it's uh, i didn't know all this so uh, i just need to take this bite once yeah 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 i'm bothering you during your lunch much apologies no no it's not lunch it's just it's just some evening snack which for which was getting prepared so i just said that you can't the cat is watching you with great interest <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so uh, it's you not know, when i was watching this film and i was watching that character that female character so one thing i i uh, felt very strongly I, i felt that you know there's no nudity anywhere very clearly mm-hmm. you know even the neck lines are not deep but there were certain uh, uh, there were certain scenes in which you know when when uh, she's wearing her uh, a wedding gown if i'm not mistaken and the way she looks the way her figure is accentuated it was so sensuous it's not even funny and i was like that there you go i mean like this is way sexier than what we have in the films today uh, but i think what you are saying uh, is very heavily reflected in the film noir movies that we have seen before this yes yes so, so it, it's yes. it's very abundant in that yes yeah it's worth doing more research if if anybody seeing this video feels like doing more research please 
post in the comments. Yes, yes, yes. Say yes. what you found. So I'm wondering how the um, Indian remake, the second remake that you saw with Amir Khan, how do they handle these issues of him, like in the Hollywood film, picking her up and so cutely saying, well, he, well, he carries her across the river. Here, hold this bag. Why? Hang on. And then he spanks her and then he takes the bag back. I think that scene was uh, edited. That was cut. So uh, that scene mm -hmm. was not there in the film. I think this scene must have created a lot of uh, outrage later around that time because 90s things had changed a lot as opposed to uh, yeah. how the way things were in uh, the 30s. So that, that bit was not there. But yes, the character was loud. It was shown as a loud character and uh, precisely the same character sketch was... Uh, followed for for for, for Amir Khan's character as well hmm. okay okay and I also figured out that uh, when we are having one-on-one -on -one meetings on zoom <laughs> this meeting can go on for 24 hours <laughs> so but the, but the recording can only go for half an hour uh, but no 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 uh, if if it's a one-to-one -one meeting like the way I, we are having right now it can go on for 24 hours <laughs> uh, the I can't minutes, go on for 24 hours. Neither can I. Uh, so, uh, but but the 40 minute capping is for a group meeting. So if we have oh, like three okay. people, mm -hmm. then then the capping becomes 40 minutes. So we don't need to worry about that. I see. Okay, I'm gonna stop worrying. Yeah, but <laughs> I am gonna. I'm gonna. <laughs> did I, did I look worried? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to flip around back to the subject. <laughs> Don't choke. <laughs> back to the subject of um, what you're doing with this, this series of discussions about films. Typically in film school and on film criticism pages, you see they always focus on the personalities. I love that you're focusing on the films without without um, getting too deeply into who the actors were or, you know, the studio history. I love that because I know nothing about Clark Gable or her name was Claudette, Claudette. Longberg. Yeah, yeah. So I absolutely love that because we avoid all the hard stuff for me. Yeah. No, no, so, uh, so I have this, uh, okay. So the guys who are watching, uh, just for your information, we had this whole conversation yesterday and I forgot to record it. So we are just No, no, it. no. You didn't forget the software cut you off. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be honest. I forgot. I, I was so excited after watching that film. I had loved it so much that I right away jumped into the discussion and I just forgot to play record. And, and it was, we were done. Okay. The whole uh, discussion was over and we were just having chit chat, you know, just about things from here and there. And then I realized that I had not recorded. It was, it was uh, like so upsetting, but anyway, so we are doing this whole thing again. <laughs> But uh, and after that discussion, uh, I have a few books for, for history of cinema. No? So there was this one huge fat volume, which is like uh, movies from the beginning till 2003. So I went through the pages and I pulled out some stuff. That's where I got to know that, you know, it's uh, based on this uh, sh uh, this short story sure. as well. So, uh, so you know, uh, and uh, about what you're saying that uh, we never discuss the background of the actors and uh, the studios. Uh, I also don't believe in studying literature uh, with this pretext of who the author was, but I also do understand that that is somehow still important. But when I, uh, but why I don't consider that as uh, a necessity when it comes to discussing films is because unlike books, films is a huge, huge, huge team effort. And, you know, mm -hmm. and even if the studios have this one idea of, portraying something or they have one set of philosophies that they want to follow. I know uh, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, filmmakers uh, go on record that, you know, uh, making a film is all about conning the producer. So even if the, uh, the a studio has that set of notions that they want to follow, whosoever is hired will find a way to, you know, uh, say and make the things the way they want to. 
so so whatever the beliefs might have been the final product is in front of you and and when so many people are involved it's almost i think impossible to follow one single philosophy because all of them do get a certain degree of freedom and expression and then the, the artistic uh, freedom that we uh, we you know uh, hand out to the people who we hire so so that's why i think when it comes to discussing films the philosophy of the studios is something which for me is secondary okay although i think you would love that today bloomhouse studios uh, or bloomhouse productions what they do is they give their director a set amount of money not a very high amount but they say we will give you exactly this much money if you go over the budget not our problem um but you have complete freedom we will not bother you in any aspect of the filmmaking at all or the post production editing so they've come away from really excellent films because I wanted to ask you a question. You as a writer, um, there's, there's the one school of creativity that in which writers like Stephen King say that the stories come to them as if being narrated by someone else or as a, another writer, Susan Power, often says it's as if her characters are almost visiting her on this day and they sit down and tell her their stories and she transcribes what they tell. The other school of creativity, I guess, is simply that um, I have the ideas in my subconscious, I put them together and in a rational, reasoned way, I work these things out. How is it for you as a writer? How's your creative process? I think uh, there's a middle ground that I tread there. I definitely have these very distinct people that I uh, that do come and visit me, and many times I do understand that whatever I'm writing, you know, this is not me. Then what is what is it? And uh, this is the times that we are living in. So I mm-hmm. do understand when they say that someone comes and tells them because. Because uh, the time that we are living in, it actually comes to you to tell you that, you know, this is what the story is. So I completely understand that. Uh, there are so many things uh, in my books, which my characters do, which I completely oppose. Like those are my uh, don't do's in life. Uh, and, you know, and, and really strictly, but, but my characters do that. Why do they do that? Because people out there are doing it. And I want to show the world that, you know, this is the world that we are living in. Don't, don't turn a blind eye towards it. So I understand that. Um, but when uh, the other uh, school of thought is saying that, you know, uh, uh, we are shaking our minds and then we are uh, yeah. pulling out ideas and then we are arranging them log- sorry, logically. logically. I understand that as well, because uh, that's what happens in the second draft. Like once you're done with your initial outburst of ideas, you know, you do have to, you know, rearrange them logically as well. Uh, I'm not that uh, masterful an author as yet that whatever I write in the first one, I think no one is. If Hemingway says that good writing is rewriting, then I guess it's the same for everyone. So, uh, so, so all of that has to happen later. But uh, so so that's why I would say that there's a middle ground that I trade. Mm -hmm. For a non-creative like myself, the notion that characters are almost speaking to through you as if you are a spirit medium, that's just awesomely spooky to me and, and amazing. Stephen King calls it the boys in the basement. <laughs> they'll, they'll bang on the pipes and send up the stories that they have. And uh, yeah. And there was some video that popped up a few, uh, a few days back on my feed and uh, it was someone was asking if Stephen King that are you still afraid to go to your basement uh, the way you used to say back in the 80s and he's like I turn I turn on the lights now so I'm not afraid. As a child I was always terrified of the basement but even you know, with the lights on. Even I, I with... never had basements so uh but and and it happened one night for me if i uh, watch this film uh, for me it's like a simple nice fun film you know 
uh, which is very innocent and which has a lot of heart and it makes you feel good and it le- leaves you you know uh, just light and relaxed so and it didn't feel like a road film to me uh, now hmm. and then when when you uh, uh, when you mentioned that you know it is a road film and then by definition it is a road film because you know they are on the road and they are traveling from one city to another by the way in the hindi uh, remake uh, they were traveling from mumbai to bangalore so that was a the journey they were on so uh, and i was like wondering why is that so and what i understood was that you know the kind of framing and the kind of uh, cinematography that has uh, been used for it happened one night it doesn't show you the road it just yes. always is like a tight cl- uh, most of the times like uh, you know only these two characters in the frame and and that's how uh, things are going so uh, so so you know, it never strikes you you know that they they are actually on a journey uh, from one place to another it's it's more like a journey of getting to know each other as opposed to you know uh, traveling physically from one place to another the blumhouse film i just remember the name hereditary okay have you seen it yet no hereditary no. incredible movie okay really incredible people um people who might avoid it thinking that it's a horror film would be missing out that 90% of it is family drama really gut wrenching divisions within the family between the mother and her son it's a powerful film in the end the last 20 minutes for me it falls apart that's when all the supernatural witchcrafty stuff comes out and i think that's where the film fails but up until then an hour and a half solid drama you should see the film hereditary i think it might be on netflix if it's not i'm sure you could find it somewhere oh, i'll i'll check it out so uh, talking about it happened one night so when i when i uh, compare it to the other hindi remakes that we had for this film uh, there uh, there were a lot of song and dance which were a, a major part of uh, both the remakes and those were like some very successful songs they were like uh, songs of their time and uh, this yeah. film had like no song and dance at all so the, the, that was something which i was missing uh, in that film because for because you know when it comes to hindi cinema fun and frolic comes with song and dance so uh, so, 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 so what's i am your- going to quote you on that fun and frolic comes with song and dance <laughs> so, so what's your take i just you? thought it came with alcohol you know? <laughs> 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 so what was your take on uh, this idea because i think around the same time a lot of musicals were also being made in hollywood yeah. and this film was not a musical no no but i think um i taught a class on this actually once um i would like to step in here and make an observation brilliant observation how the hindi film industry well all of indian cinema uses musical numbers so differently than in the west in the west musical numbers are a break from the story you know they're very often we break into song and dance and i'm not sure what that contributes to the narrative but it's almost as if the the storytelling the narrative stops at that moment so we could have the musical number with hindi cinema it seems like the song is part of the narrative without the song the story would not continue oftentimes the song is storytelling how wrong am i in that observation accepting that i've seen so very few films from both sides uh so i think uh this idea has transformed over time if i pick up olden uh, indian films uh the songs were kind of uh, interludes and you know recesses in uh in the story uh, mm-hmm. telling and the narrative but uh, then over time uh, it changed there were certain films somewhere here and there which would kind of break away from this notion and uh, use songs as storytelling devices as well mm-hmm. but uh, when it uh, it was marked and, and it was uh, promoted and projected and marketed that there is one film in which songs are n- not just ideas of uh, 
uh, a break in the in, in the narration narrative of the film it takes the story forward uh, it was hum uh, aapke hain kaun so that film was kind of pushed in a way that it has got the maximum number of songs in a hindi film and there was i think just one film a very old film which had more number of songs than that and they said that the songs are not just songs they take the story forward so yes. uh, so and from that point on it became a norm from that point on songs uh, were used as you know devices to take the story forward and not just uh, recesses in the in the song but then uh, we still do have item numbers and i i i take it as a shameful term and a very offensive term for that matter but there are there was uh, useless songs uh, item numbers are you know uh, in which uh, mm-hmm. generally uh, there's a there's a massive objectification of women and they are dancing uh, in, on the lyrics and the ways which are just not acceptable and i still don't understand uh, how come uh, the actors agree to do what they are doing anyway that's another different uh, thing of jobs yeah yeah okay different discussion altogether so uh, uh so, so this is that for it is but but you know uh, interesting you mentioned this because even till today uh, when uh, well it's been more than a year now we have not had uh, cinemas running um, but when uh, I, when uh, the cinemas used to run and when they used to be songs in a film even uh, now people uh, take it as uh, you know an opportunity to go get the popcorns or or go use the washroom and and stuff like that really? so, yeah it still happens okay i think this film has a massive uh, rewatchable quality and i yes. think i can i can watch this film definitely again and i'm sure that uh, if i watch it next time uh, uh i think i'm going to receive it differently you're right every time you do watch a film or reread a book it's always different right you you not just that you see things you hadn't noticed before i swear that always surprises me with a good film but that you have changed and so you accept the film differently um one thing that you you mentioned when i watched it again because my setup here i have a very tiny space at my desk and next to my desk this far away is a huge television screen that somebody threw away and I took it out of the garbage and it still works and I've I hooked that up to my computer and it's got wonderful sound and a great high definition high definition am i saying that word right i haven't drunk anything yet high definition <laughs> video so this and i watched the blu-ray version of the film and this time for the first time i noticed how incredibly loud the movie is the sounds of machines especially the bus engine um just it was a very loud period they lived back in and that was uh, pretty cool i'm going to say cool because consider 1934 was just the beginning of the talkies era i don't i'd i'd look it up but i'd be rude for playing with my phone in front of you um the jazz singer was the film that started the talkies and you can find those clips on youtube just google the jazz singer and you'll find al jolson sang a song oh mama and at the end of the song the audience applauded and they were supposed to go back to a silent film because all of the film is just subtitles it's a silent movie basically but al jolson said wait a minute wait a minute you ain't seen nothing yet that was the first time anybody in a movie talked and it was so amazing the studio producers just they fell out of their chairs and they said we can use this for talking and that was the start of the talkies but we'd have to google google I and mean, that was the start of the talkies period and converting movie cinemas the movie houses to um the format that would allow talking films was incredibly expensive so at first the major studios i think it was paramount maybe i could i'm probably wrong they gave money to movie house owners in new york city and los angeles so that they could convert their theaters long story short the sound recording in this film was incredible 
it was just so loud, so realistic. And for me, living in this uh, modern age where, you know, I drive a, a car that's uh, electric and so quiet, not really, it's not electric, it's hybrid, but I drive a quiet car. And at my home, I actually try to keep things as silent as possible. My computer makes a humming noise and it bothers my ears. Oy, I'm getting difficult to live with. So to see the sounds of the 1930s was just a culture shock for me. Incredible. I shouldn't say it, but it, it reminded me of my first time to go to India when I went to Madurai and the sounds of all the car horns beep, beep all the time. And it's just incredible. It's a sonic overload. I loved it. Love uh, the movie. So, love India. So uh, I, I was not able to get my hands on a very good print of this film. So uh, the uh, definition of the sound and uh, the video was not that great. But I did uh, notice uh, the sounds because the sound of the... Uh, what, what really caught me was the sound of the car that they were driving. And th that was particularly loud for me. And then the, the sound of the bus was mm. also there and even the, the airplane scene and all of that yeah. was, yeah, if, if you think about it as the a, a film set in the beginning, when the talkies were just uh, being, you know, like uh, being developed as a, a, a type of filmmaking, yeah. I think it's commendable the kind of uh, detail attention they they put, put in to make that film. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you. What's your favorite parts of the film? Which do you think were the most humorous that gave you the biggest uh, tummy tickle? Uh, so uh, there, were, there were quite a few laugh out loud moments for me. And, uh, but I think uh, I actually laughed out loud when, uh, when they're in their room and they know that the detectives are coming. So they, they fake a fight. And then the kind of conversation they have, which is like, which is like you know that it is so fake. And it is so over the top and they, are, they keep going on and, and but the, they kind of create this whole atmosphere which is so awkward for the people who've just stepped in and they are like left clueless yes. what do we do and uh, that was something which i found like really really funny uh, and a lot of other parts as well but now if i think of it uh, this one this and another one towards the end you know when they blow the trumpet uh to uh, uh, in the walls of jericho uh, fall yeah, and and uh, yeah, so so that bit was also like it was very nice, feel good, warm, funny kind of a kind of a bit. So these two are the parts which are coming to my mind right now. So so what I what were your favorite bits from the film? The funny bits. Well, the funny bits. I have to confess, I didn't have any laugh out loud moments rewatching this because when you've seen it so many times you move beyond being entertained to being too analytical. But I did love that scene in the motel when the detectives are looking for Emily and there's no way to escape it. They barge into their motel room and they say, we're looking for this woman, this millionaire's daughter. And rather than hiding her face, she looks straight at the detectives. They should recognize her. But through her acting, her character, she adopts this really tough working class voice. She says, I don't understand. Why did you tell me to do that? Get out of here. And you know, she starts hollering at her husband and he starts hollering at her. And the detectives feel uncomfortable because now they're in the middle of a family fight, of a husband and wife fight that they've started. And the hotel manager turns to a detective and he says, now see what you did. <laughs> Clark Gable says to, to uh, Emily, he says, or Peter says to Emily, he says, oh, just shut up. And she says, don't you tell me to shut up. And, and off they go. And then when the de detectives walk out, they both break down. I think that was beautifully acted on her part because she's supposed to be this rich girl who has no idea how the working class person works. You know, they didn't have television. They only had radio at the time. So she shouldn't know how to suddenly become this cranky old, old grumpy person, but she does. And it's perfect. It just fit. It was creative. I think we celebrate its creativity that two people could think so swiftly. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, this, you know, that uh, she was actually an overprotective uh, 
child and she never knew uh, anything about how the world works because the thing that she picks up is you were looking at that woman the way you were looking at her you know that's her point of uh, argument you know that that's how she starts the fight so probably she doesn't know anything about how the house works or any other problems that people might find but she knows what it's like to be jealous in love you know so so that's what she picks up to uh, to quarrel with him so and uh, uh, in yeah. the hindi remake they they used the same conversation they, they just just translated it cool cool yeah i do have to watch that i i just can't see amir khan taking on that role of the gruff reporter the working class tough guy of uh, you know said yeah, it's it, it's interesting it's interesting to watch him portray that he, he doesn't come across as that Com- uh, completely rough and aggressive kind mm. of a reporter but uh, but he he has portrayed it in some way and uh, and i don't understand mm-hmm. why that scene in which she tries to uh, you know uh, uh, get a hitch from that car uh, by, by just lifting up her dress why is that such an iconic scene i don't understand i mean like what's so special about it it's it's beyond me to understand because I think because it's the knockdown of the proud man. He just goes through this totally ridiculous spiel about, well, it's all in the thumb. Watch this. Number one, you know, number two, (laughs) number three, and everything fails. So we've got this guy who was so proud and we, the audience are laughing because it's, it's total nonsense already. And yet, they're acting it as if he really believes he has a good hitchhiking style. Um, and then she goes along and he makes a fool of himself with every car vroom, 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 passing by. And she says, can I try? <laughs> with one simple lift of the skirt, the tires screech. So that's, that's where the humor comes from, mm-hmm. knocking him off his pedestal. Uh, this, this but of course, again, today we would look at that as totally sexist, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, uh, uh, even today in the, uh, sorry, uh, it's interesting because in the Hindi version of the film, uh, this scene was a bit extended. So uh, like it, it, in mm-hmm. uh, it happened that night, we have like three or four gestures that he makes and then he gives up uh, in the Hindi version. I think they're about seven or eight and, and they're quite exaggerated towards the end. Like, you know, he's he's moving his thumb all the way up like that once. And then he's, uh, you know, like waving his uh, jacket also at one point of time and all of that. So, and finally, when uh, uh, she comes and she lifts her skirt and then the car uh, stops, uh, then he holds her hand and uh, he's, uh, uh, he tells her that don't go. This guy is, uh, I'm sure this guy is not good. So uh, uh, huh. don't go. He, he, no nice guy would stop like this if you lift your skirt up to your knees. No nice guy would ever stop for you. And she said that uh, you may do whatever you want to. If you don't want to come, go ahead, be my guest, but I'm going. So what they show is that, uh, so he stays back and she goes and then she uh, hops on into the car and then she leaves. Now, that was one thing which I felt about this film was that um, when I was watching, uh, it happened one night, this bit kind of felt like a flaw. Because, you know, it happened It happened one night throughout the film, we see them as two characters very closely bound to each other. No matter what happens, they would yes. not leave each other and they did not want to leave each other. And that's the kind yes. of chemistry the, uh, the Hindi version also was building upon. But suddenly, uh, for this one scene, she decides, I'm going to go, you, you stay wherever you want to, and uh, that's how things are, which did not add when I was watching It Happened One Night Now. But then what happens is when he's in the car, so suddenly the, uh, the guy who is driving the car uh, he stops the car and he starts molesting her. Huh. So then suddenly Amir Khan jumps uh, from the uh, from somewhere. Like it, it was a truck, so he was hiding uh, at the back of the truck, and then suddenly he jumps into the, the front uh, cabin of the truck, oh. and then, then he kind of saves her, and then he uh, takes her away, and then he kind of scolds her that you know uh, I told you so. <laughs> so so that bit was not there in the film. So that's one bit. So, uh, so interesting that you mentioned that how that scene in that film was used to uh, de-pedestal him 
from his position in this in this version of it it was used as a device to show that he was right hmm that's a little bit more disturbing than the the lake show hmm 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 i think this is the only change that they made and and the, that that spanking bit they had uh yeah removed you had to cut that yeah yeah cuz that's a physical touching well it was a it was a really good good experience watching this again and i'm so so glad we had that opportunity to talk about it you know it's been a long time i've been able to talk about a film so much with a friend even you go to the movies nowadays you leave the theater people just say ah what's for dinner nobody really wants to talk about the movie so th- thank you for this and it was a good film I, i i hope a lot more people will be able to get a hold of it yeah it was absolutely a pleasure uh, tim and it was wonderful discussing it i agree people don't like discussing movies anymore and they're more interested in other things and they don't put a lot of i don't know it's like people have lost their thoughts i believe and things have become have very we lost the ability yeah have we lost the ability to talk or think i don't know yeah and you had just spent 2 weeks watching dark murder crime noir so you needed something to take a break from that heaviness yes yes so 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 what should we watch next then but i, I enjoyed watching this film so much because it was just so um, relaxing and pleasant you know um, there was no assault of visuals or sound the way uh, we have in the uh, in the movies these days and it was just so nice and pleasant and genuinely re- relaxing you know uh, that's why i enjoyed watching this film so much you know there's a film keeps going around in my brain that i've never seen but i think it's on netflix so we both would have it available uh it's called um it's another uh, travel wrong word another road film um chennai express chennai express no 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 okay. no, 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 no 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 <laughs> it's not a good film no everybody i know has seen it <laughs> I'm the only one. Okay, Bahu Bali. No, no, no. No. <laughs> no, Chennai Express is not worth the discussion. Oh, mama. Uh, if if you want to watch Oh my Chennai, goodness. Okay. If you want to watch Chennai Express, if you're is... still interested in exploring, oh, I'll I'll watch it without you. Hey. No, no, no. I don't care. Um if you're still interested in exploring older films you wanted something more lighthearted or more color the film that came to my mind is um casablanca have you seen with um what's his what's his name i can't remember his name you're going to get on that plane and you're going to go if you don't you'll regret it maybe not today maybe not tomorrow but soon and for the rest of your life I mean it's such an excellent film Casablanca. Is it too heavy for you? World War 2 romance. Uh, I've seen World War 2 romances and I've enjoyed them. Uh, the only thing that I uh, let's do one light film and then we go back to serious stuff again. Okay. Define light film for me. Uh okay so I I, I was thinking uh, if you haven't watched a Roman holiday we can give it a shot. Okay. Let's do Roman Holiday and then let's Roman do Casablanca. Well, next time are we going to discuss Dil da Harne do? Yeah, so next time we discuss that. Oh, um, you surprised my heart. <laughs> so, uh, so so next will be Dil da Harne okay. after that we do uh, Roman Holiday and after that we do uh, Casablanca. So that's quite a lineup actually. Whatever we feel like. So uh, while I was watching uh, it happened one night uh, it was very interesting uh, that this thought came to me so it's just like you know Romeo and Juliet so Romeo uh, and Juliet have gotten married and then Juliet has come back home and uh, her, her family is disapproving of the wedding that has happened but she's say she she she's saying like you know well I'm married deal with it you know I'm uh, that's how it is and that's how it's going to be and instead of uh, taking a whole tragic turn uh, th- there's this new interpretation or or this new rewrite of the whole story so so while i was watching this film this thought came to my mind that i was like okay that's interesting like like what what if that was uh, how the setup was the things would have been not as sad as how they eventually turned out to be 
So, uh, so, so that and was what's the fun of that. It was fun. <laughs> we want Romeo dead. We want Juliet dead. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think what worked uh, the most for me was like uh, how this character she she came across as so innocent. You know, so I was watching this film and my sister came and she she watched like some five minutes or so and then then she just said that she looks so innocent and then you know that was her observation and and that was the time when i realized that that is why we are falling for that character because she is so outrightly mm. innocent i mean like that, that, that's what's so charming about her childlike yes yeah yeah and they also use those moments of hollywood cinematography where the actress would be bathed in this soft lens yeah, you could yeah. see that yeah. he's in the hard lens sharp focus and her face suddenly becomes surrounded by an aura of softness. softness. That yeah. was a typical trick they used with their actresses. Yeah. I use it on my Facebook photos too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's nice. All right. Makes me look good. <laughs> well, I gotta wrap this up. So, okay. so 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 let's thanks for talking to me. I'll see you next week when we talk about Dil Taharne Do. Yes, Del Tarakneto. That's it, the film. Yeah, you got it. You're right. <laughs> it means let the heart. It, ooh, that's what my cardiologist said. <laughs> all right, all right, Tim. It was so much fun, and thank you so much for this. And uh, see you next time, oh. then. Okay. All right, man. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. Okay.